Governor Scott Walker will soon end his first six months in office. Governor, thanks very much for sitting down with us. Good to be with you again. Thank you. Let's talk about the first six months. Um, a lot of drama, a lot of emotions, mm -hmm. a lot of trauma. Yeah. Will the second six months be quieter, sir? I certainly hope so. <laughs> I mean, I, I hope that you know, it comes to jobs and education reform and other things that we want to do really through the Wisconsin way, build a consensus, work together across party lines, bring people in from across the state. I hope we can continue to be bold. Uh, but I hope in terms of the drama and the passion and some of the things, particularly around the Capitol, obviously, I don't think any of us want to go through that again. We want to move on and, and, and turn the page, as I said the other day. Uh, but I don't think it means we should be sitting back and treading water. There, there is a critical need, even though our unemployment rate is better than the national average, even though it's better than most states in the Midwest, we still have 7.4 percent unemployment. Uh, that is much higher than it was three, four years ago. And it's unacceptable. When we've got friends and neighbors and family members, in many cases, who are unemployed. We've got to continue to work. We've got to be aggressive. There. Let me ask you about the jobless rate, because mm -hmm. you just got a letter from 15 Democratic lawmakers saying Wisconsin should seek the um, uh, unemployment insurance benefits, extending at 13 weeks, mm -hmm. take advantage of, I want to get the dollar sign right, $89 million in federal funding. Should Wisconsin apply for that, Governor? I actually pointed that out a couple months ago. I asked the Unemployment, con uh, unemployment Council to act on that and another reform that ultimately got included in the budget. So I was the first out of the gate to push for that. I think okay. that makes sense. And I was glad that after delaying action on talking about the extension to the council failing to meet, that they finally met about a week ago. But um, would taking the additional 89 million, sir, would that add to what we owe the feds? No, in this case, billion? one of the great benefits we pointed out when we addressed that to the council is we fell off in April because on the good side of things, uh, we didn't qualify because we didn't have sustained long-term unemployment levels that other states have had, so we didn't automatically have the extension. We actually had to ask for that. But this language doesn't, it, unlike the other challenges the state and other states have in terms of paying additional debt for the unemployment, this would be something that would not count for the state's amount, uh, so it would be free. And yet, again, for a lot of people, we don't want it to be permanent unemployment, mm -hmm. uh, but in the short term, while people are still looking for work, legitimately looking for work, um, if there's one more way to help them and their families, we should be going after You're going to call a special session just to do this, sir? Uh, I think the legislature is interested. If the, the draft gets there quick enough, it should be out in the next week. I think there's an interest with lawmakers to act on it. Wow. Uh, I want to ask you about a couple statements this week. You said you should have done more to get the state ready for the collective bargaining yeah. debate. And you said, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you said you were wrong on the smoking ban. Yeah, two different things. Two uh, different things. But, but, but uh, you know, somebody asked me the other day on one of my editorial boards, what would I have done in retrospect? And I said, you know, I came in very much with the mentality of a, of a, I think, a very typical small business owner in this state who says, you know, here's a problem, here's the solution, now go out and do it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, I said, we got an economic and fiscal crisis in the state, we can't wait, you know, a year or six months, we got to act on it right away, so we did. And on the economic side, we obviously had some great impact, and early on this year, Democrats, Republicans, the one independent, voted together overwhelmingly for some of the most aggressive pro-jobs agenda in the country, and it's paid off. 26,000 new jobs, 13,000 of those in manufacturing, going from a, a ranking of 41 up to 24 in terms of business-friendly states. Last year, 10% of our employers in the state thought we were in the right direction. Now, 88% think that. All those things are working. On the other part, when we talked about balancing the budget, I said I wanted to avoid the mistakes I think they're making in other states. Connecticut's laying off 5,500 people. Uh, Illinois saw massive tax increases on individuals and on businesses that have, have ultimately backfired on them. They've got an $8 billion deficit. They've got huge problems with their economy. I said, we want to do that. We, we want to provide our state and our local governments with their forms. The mistake I think I made in, in hindsight was looking at purely from a small business mentality, you know, kind of just get it done, versus a political environment where if we built a little bit more of a case made the point as to why this is needed, talked about the reforms, not only in terms of how they save money, but how now school districts, as we're seeing, can hire and fire based on merit. Uh, they can pay based on performance. They can put the best and the brightest. When you look at Kakana and you think, here's a school district that, that benefits so much from these reforms, not only are they not laying people off, they can actually put more teachers in the classroom, they can lower the size of the class, uh, and they can ultimately set money aside for merit pay. There are examples like that all across the state. If we'd made that case early on, I think we might have avoided uh, some of the, at least the degree of passion that we had out there. 
With statements like this, are you showing Wisconsin voters a softer side, Governor, <laughs> after the last six months? Well, I, I think for me, it, what people saw, whether it was in this room answering a question at a press conference or me doing a response to an editorial board, I think what people find, and you saw in the past when I was in the legislature, I think a lot of people in my, in my county when I was county executive is I'm a straight shooter. Uh, whether you agree or disagree with me, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you why I'm going to do it and what I plan on doing and how I plan on getting there. In this case, I answered the question, yeah, if, if I had to do it over again, uh, to me, I, I, I think what we've done was right and it was principled and it, it's the kind of thing that other states in the country, the federal government needs to do and why. By that I mean thinking about making long-term structural changes that, that, that think not about the next election but about the next generation. When we're thinking more about how do we put our kids in a better position than we are today. But again, I think, and we made that case early on. Um, people would have been more comfortable. Again, there would have been pushback, there would have been disagreement. I'm not saying there wouldn't have been any protests or certainly any of the national attention of money that came in from Washington. Uh, but I, just in retrospect, if I could have done it again, I would have. Um, in his June 6th column, Craig Gilbert of the Journal Sentinel cited evidence that you are the most polarizing governor in the nation. Are you? Well, you know, it's a, that's an interesting question. You look statistically at what he did, and Craig's actually a pretty fair uh, uh, reporter we've known for years. He talked about just on the polling numbers, number one amongst Republican numbers, right. uh, and the not, gap. you know, vice versa. But I think, and I brought this up at some editorial boards in the past week as well, look at what we've done. Again, part of it goes back to my point of acknowledging, saying if I had more time to, to make the case, I think things might be somewhat different. You look at what happened. We came in in February and March, made the case for why we need to make these reforms, why we couldn't wait six months or a year, push it off to the future, because in the past, Let's face it, both parties deserve some of the blame for this. Republicans and Democrats, some more than others, uh, but have deferred tough decisions. They've raided from segregated funds. They've taken stimulus money. they put off tobacco tough decisions. Money. Tobacco, tobacco money, right. So, so it's not just one party or the other. You know, some were exacerbated the last two years prior to this with the stimulus money and the other problems out there, but th there's enough blame to go around. We wanted to fix things. We figured right now, here's our opportunity to do it structurally, long term. We did, $3.6 billion deficit turned into a surplus, um, avoiding the kind of problems they're facing in Washington. But I, I look at that and I think, you know, for us, the, what we, had, we really didn't see coming was, I knew there'd be pushback for years when I challenged the status quo in my county, there was pushback as well. What I never dreamed would happen was literally the millions of dollars that were poured in by the national union leaders who said, we're gonna make this a national issue, we're gonna run TV ads like they were running a, t you know, a campaign, and, and they really turned things around and it, it tried to describe it as something that wasn't. What this is, what we change, what we reform a collective bargaining is an expensive entitlement. That's what it is. If it, if it was a right, Barack Obama would be in violation, the president would be, because federal employees don't have collective bargaining for wages and benefits. Uh, but yet it somehow got twisted because we were focused on getting the job done, they were focused on building a campaign. I think that exacerbated things. But look at the statements I made in this room and in other interviews like this for the last several months, I have always, I've always gone out of my way to praise the 300,000 public employees in the state, to thank the teachers who teach my kids in a public school and all the others out there. When you talk about division, it hasn't come out of the words we've said. People can have a disagreement over ideas. You know, we can inform the debate, but what you saw repeatedly were misstatements and attacks trying to make it look like one side was attacking the other when really most of that was coming from outside of the state of Wisconsin. To, uh, to get ready for the interview, I made a list of the things that you got the yeah. Senate and the Assembly to, to act on. Incentives for jobs, changing commerce to a corporation, um, uh, ending frivolous lawsuits, uh, you pass the budget, property tax limits, collective bargaining, yeah. and you're going to be naming the uh, state veteran secretary. Mm -hmm. What's left on your agenda, sir? Well, for us, there's still more we have to do on jobs uh, because in some ways, as much as the economy is improving here, as much as job creators, those that went from 10 to 88 percent thinking we're going in the right direction, majority of those said they're going to add more jobs in the next 12 months. All those things are good vibes for us, showing that Wisconsin truly is open for business. The challenge we have is the national economy is in the tank. In fact, when the story came out a couple of weeks ago about the May job numbers, they talked about how Wisconsin had aggressively seen an increase but it was leveling off a little bit, not because of things we had done, but because of the, the weight of the national economy. You're talking about that month that there were only 90,000 jobs created, so, right? Right, okay. right. And, it's, and, it, and it's one of those where the challenges, and why I say jobs have gotta be a priority, and I think it's, it's a great issue to bring people together on, because it's not a Republican job or a Democrat job, it's a Wisconsin job. Democrats and Republicans alike can agree on that. 
but why it's so important is in the end, we have to compensate for, for the, the lackluster status of the national economy and how the federal government in many ways not only is not helping, they're making it worse with some things they're doing. You look at the debate over the debt soon, you look at the inability of Congress to get anything done with the president, you look at even things like the, some of the decisions the administrations make, all those make it more difficult. We need to do more for us to, to overcome the national economy to show that Wisconsin can continue to lead the way. So I think you're going to look into this fall, we're going to really reach out throughout the summer and work on a number of things that can help us accelerate the economic recovery in Wisconsin. Can you give me some type of a tip? You, what, well, yeah, what, we're going to look at, I think your, there are things your, we your, can look at. Your next jobs bill is going to do what, sir? Well, it won't just be one bill. There's a series of things. We certainly have been working together on venture capital. I was just out this last week in D.C. at the National Bio uh, 2011 Conference, biotech, high technology, mm -hmm. trying to find ways to bring not only new companies but startups and extended second stage companies, working with the Technology Council, working with BioForward. Those are things where Democrats and Republicans come on, on board together on. We've got to do more of that because it's not just the 250,000 job number we have, it's the 10,000 or more new businesses in the next four years that we want to create here in Wisconsin. It's looking at viable ways to balance conserving our natural resources, protecting those resources, but at the same time looking at the possibility of things like a mining option in northwestern Wisconsin. Again, something that if done right, Republicans and Democrats can come together. It's looking at beyond just frivolous lawsuits, are there other litigation and regulatory um, barriers that stand in the way of job growth and creation in the state? All those are things we need to act on. You want those acted <coughs> on this fall or next year, sir? Well, I think this fall. I think this is one of those where, again, if you talk, as I've traveled the state listening to people, when I hear overwhelming is while they're feeling good, we're heading the right direction, we're still not out of the woods. Uh, there's a lot to be done. There's too many people who can point to a, a son or a daughter, a husband or wife, a neighbor, a friend, a fellow church member, who they're still out of work or they're underemployed. And again, 7.4% is much better than the national average, much better than most in the Midwest. But that's still, remember years ago, 3 4% was where we were hanging in Wisconsin. Do you, want to, do you still want to pass what the, what's called the capital bill, sir? No, I, I think for us, you know, there's some in the assembly that want that. We've just been wanting to put a package for it. There's some in the Senate who want to look just on the fund to fund. There's another idea. You had some Democrats the other day talking about some bonding through the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation. We want to work together and find the best way to bring each of those diverse interests together to get something that can happen this fall so we can use it to, to, to relate to some of those companies I just talked to Monday and Tuesday in Washington, our nation's capital at this conference, who are willing to come in yet this year and start creating jobs in Wisconsin. Um, in light of recent developments on the court, is it time to uh, point Supreme Court justices, Governor? Well, it's certainly worth looking at. Al although I would tell you, well, I think that is worth a long-term look, and of course it would require a constitutional amendment. Yes, uh, two, I, I think, very well-respected senators, uh, Dale Schultz and Tim Cullen, Democrat, Republican, have talked about doing this. It, you know, that would take us at, at least, you're talking several years into the future before that would even be on the ballot. Yes, in, in the interim, we've got to find a way to work with all the current justices um, and it's something, you know, there's a careful balance. They're an independent third branch of government. I nor the law. legislature should be telling them what they can or can't do. But as a citizen, not just as a governor, I look at that and say the judiciary really has to be the most dispassionate of the three branches, and that's not happening right now. And so there's got to be a way, and I, you know, I'm, I'm willing to work with the justices, the chief justice or others, if there's a way where they want a mediator or something, Beyond just this particular incident, which is extremely serious, and extremely serious allegations, we need to have law enforcement here in Dane County figure out exactly what happened. But assuming that there's some murky gray area as to what exactly happened there, that aside, there have been disputes in the past, not just amongst these two justices, but amongst others, even those that apparently are on the same side of things. We have to figure out a way uh, to diffuse that. The U.S. Supreme Court has a split court. They have their differences, and yet the justices seem to be uh, able and capable of setting that aside when it comes to personalities. That's got to happen here. If they asked you for your thoughts on how they could get along better, you would say what, sir? Well, I, I don't have a crystal answer. I, I would probably seek to bring in somebody externally, a third party, independent authority, something counselor. like that. Yeah, I mean, anytime you've got a, any organization. Now, I've been involved in the past with other organizations where they've done that, it's been quite effective. Usually. Usually there's one or two issues that, that are difficult to get over, and if somebody can help mediate that. We've even found, and we don't have disagreements, but we've even found in our Read to Lead initiative to stimulate a very diverse group of interest 
we brought in facilitators instead of having me or Superintendent Evers lead the discussion. We had these in it because they have nothing at stake. And so people didn't misread things. And we found that that decision a couple of meetings ago was one of our most successful. And now we have a great debate, and yet everybody gets along. They work together. And they find that in many cases, what they thought were differences end up being different ways of getting at the same objective. So uh, to that regard, I mean, it, it's kind of interesting for all the hype about earlier this year. We're finding ways to get beyond that. We need to make sure that every part of state government does the same. Um, you get around the state continually. Every time yeah. you see a recall Walker bumper sticker, how do you feel? You know, it, it's, people ask me about that, about poll numbers. I said if, if I governed based on polling, I would have never run for county executive. Because you know there's not a pollster alive who would tell you I could have won as the Milwaukee County Executive. Because the Republican never won before and may never win again. We won three times. And I think we won not because I was a Republican or a Democrat, but because in times of crisis, people want leadership. Anytime you're bold and aggressive, there are going to be people that kind of react that. But again, I think over time, other than just the really hardcore uh, opponents, I think more and more people wanted us to move on. They want the state to come together. I think they're going to find um, that despite what they heard from the money that came in from Washington or Chicago or Nevada or New Jersey, in the end, when they see the results, when they see two key things, when they see in September when kids go back to school and the schools are the same or in some cases better because of the reforms, and when they see in December the property tax bills are the same or lower than they've been in the past, I think things... I think people's views of things will change. So you don't expect them to get the 540,000? Oh, I think anything's possible. I think when you look at the kind of money, uh, you're talking about 20 to 25 million is likely to come in for these recall elections for nine state senators. Uh, that is, I spent 13 million for governors. So to put that in perspective, I think if you've got people from outside Wisconsin willing to pour that much money in here, uh, I would not be surprised if they paid people to try and get that many signatures. Are you going to be out helping the Senator Harsdorf and the Olsons and et cetera? And the I'll go where asked, but in the larger context, I'm not just honing in on nine Senate districts. I'm, I'm going to take the message across the state because I think it is a great message. I think people are, are amazed when they hear the facts about how beneficial these reforms are and how this is truly going to help the state go forward. And I think even more so when they contrast that, again, to other states, where the tax increases in some states have pushed jobs and people out, or in other states where the failure to act on reforms have ultimately forced massive layoffs. We're not having that in Wisconsin. Um, you, with the collective bargaining change, mm -hmm. uh, one of those changes is uh, state employees are making more payments for health care mm -hmm. or pensions. Do you think state benefits are still too generous? Or? Oh, I, you know, I never made this about whether it was too good or too bad. What I really focused in on was, here's what we've got to do to protect jobs and balance our budget. When you look at it, the 5.8% the we're asking for retirement, which is the match, again, most employers in this state, most employees in the state, at a minimum are matching. Some don't even get a match. Some it's all the employee with a 401k. But most are, are some sort of match. That's all we're asking. You look at, at, at the 12 plus percent on health care, the average middle class taxpayer in the state is paying about 20% uh, when it comes to health insurance premiums. So again, I'm not saying it's because it's too little or too, le too low. What I am saying is this is a reasonable, modest request that ultimately will protect jobs and will protect taxpayers. Do you, do you plan to recommend any more changes in, in, in curbing the fringe benefits of state employees? Sir? No, I mean, for us, you know, that's one of the concerns that some folks had talked about was even discussing whether or not there was going to be a rush of retirees that people thought I'd crawl back and try and take a retirement benefit away. We're not going to do that. The reforms that we put in place are structural. They help our local governments and our state government get our budget under control, so we avoid that. Illinois, where they've got a pension system that's only half funded, you know, they've, the speaker there's actually talked about grabbing past retirement benefits. We're not going to do that. People have vested benefits. You know, they work the lifetime based upon an assumption that when they retired, there'd be a modest uh, pension retirement package there. I don't want to take that away from retirees. Uh, what we're doing helps us avoid that. Um, the last time I got a chance, chance to talk to you, I asked you the same question. Um, on the national scene, yeah. have any of the Republican candidates for president Im impressed you? <laughs> well, I still am the same bias I had before, which is I'm biased towards a governor or former governor. I, I, I think not just as a nominee, but I think as president, you want someone who's had experience actually running something, governing. And I think that's incredibly important. So while there's plenty of good members of Congress and other candidates out there uh, that, you know, that I think are smart, intelligent people, in the end, having a governor or a former governor, uh, they, they've each had their say. You know, Mitt Romney um, you know, had, had 
recently this week, I think, put out um, an interesting point on the economy. He's talking about taxes. Tim Pawlenty was a successful two-term governor to the West in, in Minnesota. I think he's been aggressive when it comes to taxes and, and what it takes to get the economy going again. I think you're going to have other governors either who are in or going to be in, but I haven't, I haven't picked a favorite. My focus in Wisconsin, the only campaign I'm really focused in on is the campaign to create 250,000 jobs. Would you like to see the governor of Texas run for president? Kevin? I think Rick Perry's got an incredibly strong message. I, I, I would have loved it if Mitch Daniels was in. I think Rick Perry's got a credible case. Jobs is the number one issue. It's the number one state when it comes to job creation. Although I've told Rick, we moved from 41 to 24. I'd like to break the top 10. I told him by the end of my term, I'd like to be taking on Wisconsin or taking Wisconsin and heading on Texas uh, for number one spot. But I think he's got a compelling case there as well. Well, it's a summer break. What are you and your family going to do for family vacation? <laughs> uh, for us, I get a, a little a blip over the Fourth of July weekend, and then uh, for the National Governors Association, uh, it's a little a couple days out there. My family will come with me, mainly because there are other, many other governors, both Democrat and Republicans, who have kids. And so commiserating a little bit would be good. For, for me, the best, one of the best things I do is hop on my Harley Davidson uh, Road King and uh, spin around for an hour or two on a nice warm summer night. Governor Scott Walker, thanks for talking about your first six months in office. Good to be with you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.